there. Acts chapter 23. A new chapter. This is New Testament video 399. Acts lesson 75. Dear Father God, thank you for another day of grace. May the Holy Spirit edify, encourage, and enlighten us using these inspired, preserved words we will now read and study. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Acts 23 Acts chapter 23 The first 11 verses are our objective in this study. Acts 23 verses 1 to 11, reading now, Acts 23, 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead am I called in question. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel hath spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, 
so must thou bear witness also at Rome. How far back to review is the debate in my mind here? Acts 21. Start there. Acts 21. Paul concluded his third apostolic, not missionary, apostolic journey. He's in Jerusalem. In Acts 21, with a twofold purpose. One, to bring the collection, the financial relief to the poor saints at Jerusalem who belong to the Messianic Church, Israel's believing remnant. The relief he has collected from his Gentile saints, converts, believers in Greece and elsewhere Paul is also in Jerusalem to preach the Lord Jesus Christ to unsaved Israel. Apostate Israel, unsaved Israel, lost Israel, Refusing to believe whether Peter's ministry, early Acts, or Paul's ministry now, the latter Acts. Lost Israel in Acts 21 lies about the Apostle Paul there in the temple complex as the or beating Paul physically assaulting him the chief captain The colonel, his name is Claudius Lysias, we'll learn his name here in Acts 23. We don't know his name yet in Acts 21, but it's Claudius Lysias. The commander, or the colonel, of... the thousand man army, Roman army, there stationed at the Jerusalem temple, Lysias receives a report. There's a disturbance down at the temple complex. And Claudius Lysias takes reinforcements As the army, the Roman army, reaches where Paul is, the Jews left of beating Paul. They stopped. 
their violence. Claudius Lysias binds Paul and as he and his men literally carry Paul up the stairs, the steps into the stone fortress castle of Antonia. This is the north western corner of the temple complex. Paul requests may I speak to the people Lysias gives him license, permission. Go ahead, Paul. Acts 22. Paul's testimony. The events of Acts 9 are recounted. Now some... 25 years later, Acts 22. Paul explains how, as Saul of Tarsus, he used to be an apostate Jew too. Not anymore. Why? He lays it out for them. I personally met outside of Damascus the resurrected, ascended, and glorified Lord Jesus Christ. He saved me from my self-righteousness, my quote goodness, he saved me from my sins. And he commissioned me with a new gospel message. As Paul unfolds what happened to him in Acts 9, his visit with Ananias, the law-keeping messianic saint there in Damascus, and how Paul was also in Jerusalem in Acts 9, praying in the temple. He was in a trance, had a vision there. The Lord Jesus appeared to him to instruct him, to direct him, Leave Jerusalem. They will not receive thy testimony concerning me. I send thee to the Gentiles, Paul. In Acts 22, apostate Israel interrupts there. We've heard enough. Gentiles. <laughs> they threw off their clothes. Acts 22, 23. They cry out. 22 there. 22, 22. Paul is not worthy of life. It's not fit that he should live. They throw off their clothes. They throw dust into the air. They're enraged. Violent again. They were calm. Listening to his Hebrew speech. But we've had enough now. 
So the chief captain, 24, commanded him to be brought into the castle. Let's keep going, boys. Get up into the fortress. That stone fortress castle of Antonia there. To a secure location where we can examine Paul by scourging, torture. Just what is it that these Jews don't like about it? What has he done? They prepare to scourge Paul, interrogate him. The Roman soldiers here. He politely informs them I'm a Roman citizen. This is illegal. Claudius Lysias has yet to determine the problem here. Well, we can forget a confession by torture. We cannot torture him. So Claudius Lysias fears I've illegally bound a Roman citizen. I was on the verge of scourging him. Claudius Lysias is scared. What do I do now? Oh! I have an idea. And this was how we closed our last study. Acts 22.30 On the morrow, because he, Claudius Lysias, the chief captain, would have known the certainty wherefore he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands, shackles, and commanded the chief priests and all their council, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, to appear, and brought Paul down and sent him before them. So Paul appears in front of the Sanhedrin to give a speech, sermon, discourse. That speech is Acts 23, 1 through 10 there. That's our present study. Paul's six defenses, discourses, or speeches here in this part of Acts. Acts 22, that was number one. Acts 23 here is number two. There's a third speech, Acts 24. A fourth speech, Acts 25. A fifth speech, Acts 26. And a sixth speech, Acts 28. Paul's speech before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, which is 
a 71 member body composed of Israel's religious leaders. The high priest is the president of the Sanhedrin. These are the so-called Bible scholars. <laughs> When Jesus was tried over two decades ago, he was before the Sanhedrin. In early Acts, Acts 4, Acts 5, Acts 6, Acts 7, Israel's apostles and Stephen spoke before the Sanhedrin. Now it's Paul's turn. He shares his testimony. Acts 23, 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, He looks around at all of those faces staring at him, dozens of men. He possibly recognizes some of them. After all, the Sanhedrin had granted him authority all those years ago in Acts 9 to head to Damascus. There may be some of Saul's, Paul's, former friends here. Oh, they're much older, like he is. But there they are, former colleagues. Acts 23, 1. Whether friends or strangers, Paul is cordial, polite to them. Acts 23.1 Men and brethren, not his spiritual brethren, but his physical brethren, his fellow Jews. He addresses them, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. He recounts all the way back up to right now. I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Romans 2. Romans 2, fourteen. Romans 2, 14. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, 
which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. The conscience. 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 With knowledge. Literally. The conscience is the internal system in our heart of standards and norms that we use to evaluate what we should think and do. Romans 2, those verses we read moments ago, I read moments ago. I hope you were reading in your own Bible, King James Bible, with me there. The conscience and the law. Although the law of Moses was given to Israel, Israel, not the Gentiles, that did not mean the Gentiles had no spiritual light whatsoever. The sense of right and wrong, the knowledge of right versus wrong, Israel had that codified in the law. Here is what God says, don't do. Here is what God says, do. The Gentiles did not have the law. Unto the Jews were committed the oracles of God, the Word of God, the law, Bible, Old Testament scriptures, the Hebrew Bible. Anyway, Though the Gentiles did not have the law, they had no Hebrew Bible, they had no stone Ten Commandments, tablets. The Gentiles did have a conscience, everyone does. What about those who haven't heard? Ah, uh, you don't know how much they've heard. You don't know how much they know. The Gentiles still had some basic understanding between right and wrong. Israel had the law, Gentiles had conscience, but everybody knew a little something from the Creator God. The Gentiles and their conscience there, the conscience would either accuse you're doing wrong, or excuse, you're doing right. Not to say the conscience was perfect, 
infallible, inerrant. Because the conscience can be perverted, corrupted. Let your conscience be your guide. Uh, no. <laughs> we have the Holy Bible. Let it, rightly divided, be our guide. And let us be satisfied. Whether as Saul of Tarsus or the Apostle Paul, Saul Paul lived his entire life under the impression he was serving God, the Lord God, Jehovah God. The big G, God, the Creator God. Acts 23.1 I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Acts 24 Acts 24, 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Acts 23, 1. I have lived in all good conscience before God until... This day. Now you think about it. First Corinthians eight. Let me make these observations first. First Corinthians eight. There is what is known as the weak conscience. No good doctrine in it. Can't be mature. Little to no sound doctrine. No mature advanced doctrine. So the person has a weak conscience. There's a good conscience, Acts 23, Acts 24, 1 Timothy 1, Hebrews 13, 1 Peter 3, good conscience. 1 Corinthians 8, Titus 1, a defiled conscience. Well, I think you can figure out what that is, huh? Corrupt, bad doctrine. False doctrine, corrupt conscience. First Timothy four, verse two, their conscience is seared with a hot iron. Now, do you have to be a genius to comprehend that the conscience Seared with a hot arm. In other words, nothing bothers the seared conscience. I do whatever I want. The nerve endings destroyed spiritually. Sin doesn't bother me. They're just so comfortable with their error. 
because they've been like that for so long. Seared with a hot iron, rendered insensitive, callous, apathetic. The person doesn't care. Hebrews 10, the evil conscience. <laughs> I think you can figure that one out too, huh? Yeah. All right. The conscience is not always a reliable authority or trustworthy judge of truth and error. Uh, remember those terms? I just outlined for you there the different types of conscience. Well look at this in Paul's case, Saul's case, Acts 23 1, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Think back to Saul of Tarsus conducting his <laughs> ministry. Acts 7, Acts 8, Acts 9. He's the devil's minister. Lost, 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 lost. But he thinks he's all right. John 16. Hmm. Disturbing. John 16. 2. The Lord Jesus. The Upper Room Discourse John 16, 2 Not long from now Christ Jesus will be arrested Try Wrongfully Condemned And Crucified John 16, 2, hey, little flock, the world, will treat you like they treated me. Because you belong to me, and they belong to the devil. They don't believe that, though. John 16, 2, they shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth Satan's service. Wrong. <laughs> no. No Satan here. John 16, 2. Take them off. John 16, 2, they shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God. God! God service. God service. You mean, you, you mean, you mean, you mean, Think of the confusion here. Grasp it. This is, this is 
unfathomable, incomprehensible. Lost Israel by killing God's people, the saints, the Messianic Jews, unbelieving Israel will be under the impression by killing Jesus' followers. They're serving God. Madness. Madness. This is crazy. This is folly. But this is mindless works religion. And participants in Satan's evil world system, they're religious. But lost. Still, they don't believe they are. No, we serve the Lord. We don't serve the devil. <laughs> I think both the Lord and the devil would disagree. <laughs> Could I be brutally honest? Do you know right now, individuals in religion, they think they're serving the God of the Bible, but they aren't. They're doing someone else's service, and it's not the God of the Bible. Huh. How do we know who they are, Brother Sean? Uh, you'd better get that King James Bible. Study it, rightly divide it. And if anyone disagrees with that rightly divided King James Bible, well, there are the devil's servants. Whether they know it or not, no matter how kind, knowledgeable they are, it doesn't matter. They're not doing God's service. That's if we believe the Bible. Hmm. I don't believe the Bible. Fine. Wonderful. Enjoy the error. Have it. Free will. leads the nation Israel's rebellion against Jesus Christ in early Acts. Because Jesus' sermon there in John 16 prepares the little flock for their Acts ministry. Saul of Tarsus is at the head of Israel's rebellion in early Acts. Acts 7, Acts 8, Acts 9. Repeated Acts 22 and Acts 26. Galatians 1 and Philippians 3 and 1 Timothy 1 and on and on and on. Saul, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, as he was arresting and dragging off those Messianic Jews to prison, as they were being tortured and slaughtered viciously, Saul of Tarsus 
there at Stephen's stoning, the next seven, and taking great pleasure in it. Acts 8 1, consenting to Stephen's death. Saul of Tarsus heading to Damascus to persecute more believing Jews. He thinks he's serving God. Yeah, yeah, see that? The, I'm serving God. <laughs> the little G God, though, the God of this world, not the big G God, not the capital G, the uppercase G God. Saul didn't know it yet, but he found out outside of Damascus, uh-oh, I've been serving the wrong God all along. Mm-hmm, you have. Saul, it's time you have stopped wasting time with nonsense. For the last 25 years now, the Apostle Paul has served the Big G God Capital G, uppercase G. He thought he was serving God as Saul of Tarsus, Acts 7, Acts 8, early Acts 9. No, now he's serving the big G God. He has served the Lord God. Whether as a lost man or a saved man, Saul Paul was never willingly, knowingly serving the devil, but he really was. Whether he knew it or not didn't matter. As Saul of Tarsus, he did do the devil's work. Acts 23.1 And Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Two. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to praise the Lord. No. Acts 23, 2. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. This Ananias... Ah, oh, stop. Wait. Bear in mind... More than one church in scripture, more than one gospel. There's more than one Mary. There's more than one Jesus. There's more than one Simon. There's more than one Caesar, more than one Herod, more than one baptism, more than one Judas, more than one Spirit, more than one James, more than one Antioch. We grow up. Ananias, Acts 23, is a high priest here. 
But this is not the Ananias of Acts 9. Acts 22. This is another Ananias. See? More than one Ananias in the Bible. Ananias the high priest. Ananias the high priest. This is not the high priest Annas presiding over Jesus' trial 25 years ago. Annas was like 90 years old. He'd be 115 now. But no, he's not alive anymore. Not physically. Ananias the high priest. Ruled to approximately A.D. 59. So that gives us a window of time. Ananias the high priest served in the 50s, but not beyond 60. This Ananias was historically known for his brutality. Ananias the high priest, in Acts 23, 2, commanded them that stood by Paul to smite him on the mouth. To punch Paul's mouth to smack him in the mouth, on the mouth. Strike him. I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day, Paul, that's inappropriate. Strike him, please. In the eyes of apostate Israel, Paul is apostate. <laughs> Ironically. Paul seems to be the unbeliever here. Paul is arrogant. Paul has fallen from the truth, they think. Paul, how dare you assert you've lived in all good conscience before God until this day? Huh? In their mind, Paul is a godless renegade, a rebel, or following Jesus of Nazareth. You started the sect of the Nazarenes. <laughs> Look at that charge. Acts 24, 5. For we have found this man... Paul, a pestilent fellow. <laughs> oh, they say that about Christians today. And a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world. And a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. 
Paul started that cult. Hmm. Be some rabbinical scholar gone crazy. He hated Jesus of Nazareth with a passion. And now he preaches him equally as fervently. A very strange man we have here, boys. This Paul, this Saul of Tarsus. Paul, you're no servant of God. Shut up. Silence! They punch Paul to stop him from talking. John 18. John 18, 22. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest? So? Shut up, Jesus. And he's punched. Be quiet. Shut up, Jesus. Shut up, Paul. This continued the talking. In Acts twenty one twenty one. They're informed of Paul that he teaches all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. 28 there. This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law in this place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. How can you say, Paul, you've served God here? In all good conscience, you hate Israel, you hate the law, you hate our temple, you polluted our temple. Acts 23, 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. You liar, you. That's what Ananias is thinking. And the rest of the Sanhedrin. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by to smite him on the mouth. Verse 3. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee. Thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? Verse 3, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. <laughs> Ooh. Contrary to popular belief. Paul was neither angry nor childish here. Paul wrote in Romans 12, Romans 12, 14, Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Retaliation. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. 
For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Deuteronomy 32. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Titus, Titus 3. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, government, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Wow, good boy! Respond, Acts 23, 3. God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. Paul is not vindictive or petty or immature. What he is is knowledgeable of the fact that God will smite Ananias. Ananias will not get away with what he has done, what he is doing. You see, the Lord does not sleep, meaning when everyone else has their eyes closed deliberately or unintentionally, the Lord's eyes are wide open. Nobody saw me. The Lord did. <laughs> hmm. Ananias, you won't escape the justice of God. Thou whited wall, a whited wall, Matthew. 23, reminiscent of the Lord Jesus in Matthew 23. <laughs> now there is an eye-opening chapter, Matthew 23. Read it if you haven't done so already. It's descriptive of religion right now, 2,000 years later. False religion. Matthew 23, verse 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, tombs, graves, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Christ was not a feel-good preacher, was he? He told it like it. He told it like it is. 28. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Mm -hmm. 29. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because... Ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, 
we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Huh? That's rhetorical. You know you will not escape the damnation of hell. It's impossible for you to escape the damnation of hell. You know what? The very people in his audience, right here in Matthew 23, are scheming to crucify him. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, you've kept up the family tradition. Your forefathers killed the prophets. And you, you're preparing to slay me. I know just a few days from now, Actually, about two days. Israel's corrupt religious leaders were hypocrites. Mm -hmm. Another offensive chapter is John 8. Try that one. You think Matthew 23 is brutal? Read John 8. Why did sepulchers? Matthew 23, 27. The Jews would paint the tombs white. Bright white, stay away, unclean corpses here. Body parts, bones, don't touch, or you will be ceremonially unclean, defiled. See, the law of Moses told them about that. Don't touch dead bodies or body parts. So they would advertise their tomb, grave, stay away, white, bright white. All right, from a distance, you look at the, the grave, the monument, the headstone, whatever. Oh, look how wonderful that is. A beautiful decorated piece of artwork. You get up close, let's lift it, let's dig here, ah, oh, it's a body, I'm clean. You see, <laughs> on the outside, it looked okay, attractive, but do some investigation. What's behind that veneer, that facade? Death. Matthew 23 there. Israel with the works religion. Wonderful exterior, outside. Internally, ugh, God looks right through to see this is hypocrisy. What's inside? There is no life of me inside there. It's the flesh. Rotten, dirty sinners. Covering up their sin problem. Self-righteousness. Acts 23. God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, 
whited wall. A whitewashed wall. Say that three times fast. Whitewashed wall, whitewashed wall, whitewashed wall. <laughs> whitewash was a paint. That's that white paint. Of lime and chalk. It was used to beautify something that was ugly, dirty, degraded. Ananias, you're nothing but a hypocrite, a whited wall. Or to state it another way, you're like a rotten wood framed house that's been painted over. No stability, no integrity, no soundness, perverted. And see, Ananias hides behind the same watered down works religion that those in Matthew 23 did almost 30 years ago. That's what Saul of Tarsus used to be a part of himself, he knew. Religion is useful in disguising hypocrisy, even now. The Bible is relevant. It's 2,000 years old, its most recent portions, and yet it's so current So appropriate, so timeless. Acts 23, 3. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? The high priest, he was supposed to be seeking justice, righteousness, what is fair, what is honest, what is good. These religious leaders sit in judgment of Paul Let's compare what you're teaching to what Moses taught us. Meanwhile, they really aren't paying attention to Moses. No more than they paid attention to Moses in Jesus' day. Had you paid attention to Moses and listened to Moses, you would have believed me. John 5, you didn't believe Moses. That's why you don't believe me. Woohoo! On that. That's another offensive portion of Scripture. John 5, read that too. Mm. Thou sittest to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? Exodus. Paul is a rabbinical scholar trained under Gamaliel, Gamaliel, Acts 22. He knows the Hebrew Bible. Exodus 23, for instance. Verse 1. Exodus 23, 1, Thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. That is, uh, <laughs> corruption, in the courts. Cr 
crooked judges, legal officials, <laughs> like today. Leviticus 19, 15. Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. See that? Verse 35, look. Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, in metered, in weight, or in measure. Business. Don't be a dishonest business person. How can I make a quick buck? <laughs> oh, that's relevant too, huh? Deuteronomy 19. Deuteronomy 19. False witnesses are forbidden. Well, you remember, thou shalt not bear false witness. Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, the ninth commandment. Don't lie in court. Hmm. You can read Deuteronomy 19, 15 to 21 there. Deuteronomy 25. 1. If there be a controversy between men and they come unto judgment, they're before a judge, that the judges may judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. See? And it shall be, if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face, <laughs> according to his fault, by a certain number. John 7, John 7, 51. Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? No. No. One other verse. Proverbs 18. 13. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. I don't know what's about to be said, but I already have an answer for it. <laughs> Stupid. Preposterous. In Acts 23, there's crookedness in the courtroom. Ananias is a wicked man, and yet he is Israel's chief religious leader. He's the high priest. The Jewish historian Josephus writes just a few years after this a Jewish war broke out against the Romans in Jerusalem and Ananias the high priest and his brother Hezekiah were killed assassinated. Ananias here, the high priest, was slain by his own Jewish people.
He was removed from office, wasn't he? Acts 23. 3. You have commanded I be smitten contrary to the law. There is no righteousness here. There is no justice here. This is a mockery. Ananias already determined Paul to be guilty before Paul even finished his testimony. He gets a few words out. Quiet. That's all you see. Acts 23, 4. And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest. <laughs> Pious bystanders here. Paul, how dare, how dare you speak evil of God's high priest. Uh, not our high priest or the high priest, but God, God's high priest. See that? You're so brash, Paul, to disrespect God's representative here. Well, the little G God, Ananias is certainly not the capital letter G, God's servant. Paul is God's servant, but not Ananias. <laughs> Acts 23, 4. Revilest thou God's high priest? Paul replies, 5. Then said Paul, I wist not. Wist, wisdom. I applied wisdom not, brethren that he was the high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Now, why didn't Paul recognize the high priest? A number of reasons have been suggested. Paul's vision was poor. Paul had limited eyesight. Maybe he was being sarcastic. Well, I didn't expect the high priest to do what you did, Ananias. How can you be the high priest? That was improper, inappropriate for me to be smitten, for you to command them to smite me. Was the high priest not wearing his official garments? was someone else sitting in the high priest's seat, and the high priest was sitting in someone else's seat. Oh, that's why Paul's confused. Maybe Paul did not know what the high priest looked like. Remember, Paul did not have internet access. To look on the Sanhedrin's website, who is there? President, who's the high priest at this time? No, Paul didn't have photographs. And he's been out of Jerusalem for some years. One brother remarked, More than likely, Paul failed to recognize Ananias as high priest because in that particular era, of Jewish history, there were many and rapid changes in the priesthood. Sometimes the office of high priest was vacant for a good long while, during which time it was filled by someone who only acted as high priest, until another could be placed officially in office. 
According to Josephus, this was the case at the time Paul came before the Sanhedrin for trial on this occasion. Ananias was not the official high priest, but was filling the office temporarily. Whatever the reason for Paul's not recognizing this man as the high priest, there was instantly a note of apology in his speech, showing respect for the office if not for the man who occupied it. Again, Acts 22, 3. I was brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, Gamaliel, Rabbi, the finest rabbi of that time, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God. See, I was serving God. He thought he was. As ye all are this day, they think they are. Paul is a trained rabbinical scholar. He's an expert in Jewish law, the Hebrew Bible. Acts 23, 5. Look, he demonstrates. Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, not it was written, but it is written. That's preservation. Bible preservation. Moses wrote this 1,500 years prior to Paul. But it's still written. Why? In manuscript copies. Acts 23, 5. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Exodus. The law of Moses. Exodus 22, 28. Exodus 22, 28. Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. These governing officials who should be representing God, these leaders of Israel, Moses told Israel, don't speak evil of them. Well, Acts 23, 5, Paul quotes, Hey, you remember what Moses said? I do. I bet Paul knew that law of Moses better than they did. So Paul has found an excuse to introduce some Bible truth. Now that we're here, I'd like to talk about the Bible. Hmm. Well, let's see if they want. Remember the Word of God? Acts 23, 6. To eight. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead. I am called in question. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Paul studied the crowd. He assessed the situation. Hmm. I will not get a fair trial here. No warm reception here. So he... proceeds to employ that old military strategy of divide and conquer. With Ananias' hostility 
and the general negative atmosphere of the Sanhedrin Paul devises a way to introduce more Bible truth. See, he's not really interested in defending himself. He's a nobody. But the God he serves and that God's doctrine, they are what matter. Acts 23, 6. When Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren! We have two warring factions of Judaism here. Primary six of Judaism. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. Paul takes advantage of this major disagreement between those parties. Men and brethren, Acts 23, 6, I am a Pharisee. Acts 22, 3, I was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel. Gamaliel, Acts 5, 34, was a Pharisee. Uh, Paul is a Pharisee. Acts 26, 5, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Philippians 3, 5. Philippians 3, 5. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. I'm not a proselyte. I'm not a Gentile. I am a blood Jew. And I am a rabbinical Scholar, I'm a Pharisee. I am trained in the law of Moses. It is revealed here, Acts 23, 6, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. That's all we know about Paul's father. Paul's father was a Pharisee, and of course Paul's father was a Roman citizen, which is why Paul was a Roman citizen. It passed down to the next generation. Paul's father was a Pharisee. Paul's teacher Gamaliel, Gamaliel was a Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee is a Pharisee. Acts 23, 6. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. The hope and resurrection of the dead. This hope here, this is not Israel's kingdom. Paul did not preach the gospel of the kingdom. Those who believe he did take verses such as this. Paul preached the hope, the hope of Israel. That's the kingdom. No, 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 sorry, wrong. The hope of Israel is resurrection, bodily resurrection. See, in this context, it tells you Acts 23, 6, of the hope and resurrection of the dead. The dead hope to be resurrected. See that? Resurrection is the hope. We won't stay dead. 
See, physically they're dead. Spiritually, in the spiritual realm, they're still alive. Acts 24, 15. Acts 24, 15. What is the hope of Israel? Acts 24, 15. And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. See, the Jews have a hope toward God. There will be a resurrection of the dead, bodily resurrection. See? 21. Touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. Acts 26, 6. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise are twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. 8. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Acts 28, 20. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. The hope there is the hope of resurrection, bodily resurrection. Paul has been preaching Jesus' bodily resurrection and that there will be a bodily resurrection of everyone else. Bodily resurrection is the hope of the Abrahamic covenant. Romans 4 17, 16, see there, Abraham. 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead. Resurrection gives life to the dead. And calleth those things which be not as though they were. God quickens the dead. Abraham, he was physically incapable of reproducing. He was too old. That's all right. Abraham's reproductive organs were functionally dead. Sarah's womb was dead. God gave both sets of organs life. And look, a child's produced Isaac. Bodily resurrection. You read Genesis 17, for example. I will give the promised land, Abraham, to thee and thy seed forever. Well, Abraham needs to be resurrected to go into that land forever. He and all his other descendants who die physically. Bodily resurrection. Acts 23, 6. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. I am being judged. I'm being judged here on the grounds of the hope and resurrection of the dead. Okay. Verse 7. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. Uh-oh. <laughs> He's pitted them against each other. The Pharisees and the Sadducees argue amongst themselves. 
Some are for resurrection. Some are not for resurrection. Paul has exposed the rift <laughs> that's been there all this time. And now they get after each other instead of attacking him. <laughs> how, how wise. The focus is off Paul and on the doctrine of God's Word. Resurrection! Resurrection. All right. Verse 8, Acts 23, 8. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. There's the heart of their quarrel. <laughs> Paul, a Pharisee, I am being judged because I preach the hope and resurrection of the dead. So the Pharisees, they say, Amen, brother. But the Sadducees frown. Oh, no, 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 no. Not true. And the Pharisees hit back, Yes, it is. And the Sadducees, No, it isn't. Yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> hmm. So there's a heated debate. Intense. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection, no such thing as angels, no spirits. Matthew 22, Matthew 22, 23. The same day came to him the Sadducees with a trick question, which say that there is no resurrection, and they ask him about resurrection. <laughs> we don't believe in resurrection, but Jesus, we have a resurrection question. You want to respond? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, they are sincere seekers of the truth. Yeah, right. They had invented a puzzle to cause Jesus to stumble, but he didn't. He didn't. He outsmarted them. And he took a verse, Exodus 3, 6, Matthew 22, 32, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. God said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. When he was talking to Moses in Exodus 3, verse 6, not I was, but I am. The italicized word am in Exodus 3.6 is needful. Don't remove it. Otherwise, Jesus' argument falls apart here in Matthew 22. I am. I still am. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And yet Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by Moses' time, have been dead long time, physically, but they're still alive spiritually. Their souls hadn't gone out of existence. They were still living, though physically dead. The present tense verb, am, I am, not the past tense, I was the God, but I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Their souls hadn't disappeared forever. Those souls were waiting to be reunited with the physical body. Well, the Sadducees are embarrassed. <laughs> they can't argue with that. They leave. Uh -huh. It backfired. Their plan failed. 
Mark 12, 18. Repeat it. Mark 12, 18. Jesus outsmarted them. <laughs> then come unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. See? Luke 20. Luke 20. 27. Then came to him certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. The Sadducees were richer and more powerful in Judaism than the Pharisees. The Sadducees were the aristocrats, wealthy. They were the snobs who stayed to themselves. So you read very little of them in Matthew to John. Mostly it's the Pharisees. They would mingle with the common people. See? But the Sadducees were religious hermits. The Sadducees, at the time of Acts 5 anyway, Acts 5, 17, Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. In Acts 4, verse 1 there, Acts 4, 1, The priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon the apostles, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. No, there's no such thing as resurrection. The apostles aren't telling the truth. <laughs> How many church members we've lost because they preach resurrection and we don't preach resurrection. See that? In Matthew 28, it's those chief priests who don't believe in resurrection who devise a scheme to dismiss Jesus' bodily resurrection. It's a body snatching. It's not a resurrection. We can't afford to admit it was a resurrection because our theological system would disintegrate to nothing. Fighting against the truth with every ounce of energy they can muster. It's not an evidence problem. It's a heart problem. They don't want to believe. They could see 50,000 resurrections. And you know what they say? Oh, no, no resurrection. That's a fairy tale. Because they've closed their heart. They don't want to believe. So it doesn't matter what they see or hear. It does not matter what they see or hear. The Sadducees were the skeptics, the liberals, the rationalists, the modernists. They spiritualize verses. These don't mean what they say. Figurative, allegorical. See, that's how you can sidestep the literal verses there. There's a hidden meaning that only a select few can grasp. You can't believe it at face value. And see, that's how the denominations get away with what they do and teach. Even now, the Sadducees were more sympathetic toward Rome. The Pharisees were Jewish nationalists. They hated Rome. The Sadducees likely formed because of that 400 year period of silence between Malachi and Matthew. Malachi and John the Baptist in Matthew. The famine of the hearing of the words of the Lord, Amos 8. Since God had spoken to Israel for so long, 
through angels, prophets, the written word. And Israel overwhelmingly responded with la 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 la. Okay, if that's what you want. As the Gentiles in Romans 1, so Israel is blinded now. And God says nothing for 400 years. And that is why there is that gap between Malachi and Matthew. 400 years of silence. That's when the apocryphal books were written, by the way. When God wasn't speaking, God didn't speak the apocryphal books. Mm -hmm. Forgeries. God did not send an angel. He didn't send a prophet. No visions. Nothing. The canon of the Hebrew Bible was closed. And that was it. For 400 years. Well, the Sadducees, and they are the priestly sect, remember. The Sadducees did not see angels or anything supernatural during those 400 years of Malachi to Matthew. Oh, well, there are no such miracles, no supernatural events, no angels, no spirits, no resurrection either. But see, you could look today and argue that and be wrong. Where's the wrath? God doesn't judge sin. I guess He doesn't care about sin. Oh, yes, He does. There's just a change in program. This, not this. See? Today, but now, future, ages to come. Just as God changed His dealings with man, beginning with Paul. After Malachi, God changed his dealings with Israel. No more talking. Shh. I won't talk for 400 years. The 400 years of silence. And John the Baptist comes following the 400 years of silence. If anyone wanted to hear from God prior to John the Baptist, between Malachi and John the Baptist, they'd better take that Hebrew Bible and read what God had already spoken before he kept quiet. The Pharisees now. The Pharisees, well, read it again. Acts 23, 8. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. There is a resurrection. There are spirit beings. Spirits and angels fall under the category of spirits, of course. Spirit beings. The Pharisees were the really strict religionists. That was Saul of Tarsus. 26, Acts 26, 5. Which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. See? See that? Whereas the Sadducees did not believe in angels, spirits, or resurrection, which is why they were sad, you see. <laughs> the Pharisees believed the Hebrew Bible, literally. And we are sticklers of it. Philippians 3. See, here's Paul again, the Pharisee. Philippians 3. 5. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, is touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, 
touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless. The Pharisees were the, what has been called the super separated. The Sadducees, that is derived from the Greek equivalent of Zadok, the priest Zadok. Z-A-D-O-K, Sadik, Sadducee, C. The Pharisees could be from any background in Israel. The Sadducees were priests, but the Pharisees were not. The Pharisees were strict, super separated. They're the extra holy. So if the Sadducees were fervent in their unbelief, the Pharisees were just as zealous of being conservative in their interpretation of the Hebrew Bible. The Sadducees accepted only Moses' writings, which is why Jesus, when answering them, appealed to Exodus 3. Moses, go argue with Moses. <laughs> the Pharisees, well, they took the Bible and tradition. They're all equal. Traditions, the oral law and God's written law. They had the written law, the Bible, and the so-called oral law, the traditions. The Pharisees. Mark 7. This way. Mark 7, 1. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be, which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, the Lord Jesus, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? The washing of hands here was not for hygienical purposes. Someone will get food poisoning if we don't wash hands. That's not it. This is for religious reasons. The tradition of the elders was hold your hands with your fingers up. There's a trickle of cool water to run down. And it was three times up and three times down. And if you confuse the order, start again. Don't take an unclean hand and touch a clean hand, or they're both unclean and you start again. And don't mix the order. If you do three times down and three times up, uh -uh, wrong. Wrong procedure. Wrong order. Start again. Up. Down. Ah, uh, well, that's the silliness in religion. And these Pharisees and these scribes are upset, uncomfortable. Jesus, why don't your disciples follow the tradition of the elders? All worked up. But you know what does not bother them? What they do which is far more offensive to God than what those disciples of Jesus 
did. Mark 7, 6. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. Hypocrites! As it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Heart problem. Isaiah 29. They go through the motions in religion externally, but internally, no faith. They don't worship God with their religion. They worship their religion. Mark 7, 7. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. 13. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Read the rest of those verses up to, what, 23 there. You are so fearful of dirty hands, but you people have dirty hearts. You know what sends people to hell? Not the dirty hands, but the dirty hearts, the sinful hearts. <gasps> See, they're all mixed up. Mixed up. Just like traditionalists today in religion, they discarded the scriptures when the scriptures taught something they didn't want to believe or do. I follow tradition. I don't care about the Bible. Well, whoever says that, at least they are honest. They don't pretend, yeah, I believe the Bible when they really don't. The Pharisees were far more conservative than the Sadducees. The Pharisees were like the fundamentalists and the evangelicals, although they had their problems too. Their doctrine wasn't as pure as it could be either. Acts 23.9 Acts 23.9 And there arose a great cry. They're talking over each other. There's a clamor. I'm talking. No, I'm talking. Yes, no. Yes, no. And they go back and forth. Yes, resurrection. No, resurrection. They're at odds. Great shouting breaks out. Acts 23.9, the scribes of the Pharisees, the scribes that were of the Pharisees, the scribes are the literate men, the literate men in the nation. They can read and write. Very few in the nation could read or write, but the scribes could. The scribes were the Bible copyists, the Bible teachers. The scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose, nine, and strove, fighting, saying, We find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel hath spoken to him, let us not fight against God. The Pharisees are open to the possibility an angel or a spirit spoke to Paul. See, they believe in angels and spirits. The Sadducees do not. So the Pharisees, 
they're willing to ignore Paul supporting Jesus Christ. We don't worry about that. But Paul, amen, brother, resurrection is true. <laughs> Acts 22, how Paul had conversed with the Lord Jesus there. Acts 22, historically Acts 9. Acts 22, 7, 8, 10, 18, 21. Some of those Pharisees probably heard Paul in Acts 22. Maybe Paul did hear from a spirit or an angel. We give him the benefit of the doubt. Unlike you, Sadducees. <laughs> a textual note. Acts 23.9 in our King James Bible. We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel hath spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Let us not fight against God. That hortatory expression there, that exhortation, let us not fight against God, absent from the corrupt Alexandrian Greek New Testament and modern English versions based on that faulty manuscript family. But our King James Bible, the Textus Receptus, has those words in Greek, Translated into English for us. Let us not fight against God. See, the thought is complete in the King James. Modern versions leave the thought hanging. And they make it a question. What if an angel or spirit has spoken to Paul? Let us not fight against God. That sounds like Gamaliel, Gamaliel, Paul's mentor, rabbi, teacher there. Acts 5, see? Acts 5, 39, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. And that was concerning the Sanhedrin's persecution of Israel's apostles. Now here the Sanhedrin and the Apostle Paul, Acts 23. Acts 23, 10. And when there arose a great dissension, they're really getting out of hand now, This is getting more violent. This is escalating. The chief captain, Claudius Lysias, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. These people are hysterical. Hurry! Go get Paul before they literally tear him limb from limb. Back to the castle, the stone castle, the stone fortress of Antonia, secure location, and away from the Sanhedrin, belligerent Sanhedrin. As in chapter 21, so the Roman army protects Paul from apostate Israel, unbelieving Israel, violent Israel. Acts 20. 
3, 11. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Paul is discouraged that night. Acts 21, problems. Acts 22, problems. Acts 23, problems. In Jerusalem. It gets to the point where Paul needs direct intervention. Now remember, Paul does not have a completed Bible. We do. 2 Corinthians 12, 1. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. While the Bible is still being prepared, it's not all written down, God speaks apart from the written word to Paul. And Paul has another vision. This is the fifth one in Acts. Acts 9, Acts 16, Acts 18, Acts 22, here Acts 23, and Acts 27. There's a vision. The Lord Jesus Christ stood by Paul Cheer up! For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Peter had a vision, Acts 10, Acts 11. Paul has another vision. Paul is Peter's replacement. Prophecy has given way to mystery. Paul discouraged in Corinth, Acts 18, 9, years prior, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall sit on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city, Corinth. Paul was discouraged, Acts 18. He's discouraged again, Acts 23. There is the Lord. Be encouraged, Paul. You have testified of me in Jerusalem. You've borne record witness of me in Jerusalem. Testimony. You're going to Rome. And you talk about me over there now. You share me in the Gentile world capital, Rome. Rome. Paul endeavored to go to Rome. Acts 19 in Ephesus 21. Paul purposed to go through Macedonia and Achaia, then to go to Jerusalem. He's been to Macedonia and Achaia now, Acts 20, and Jerusalem, Acts 21, Acts 22, Acts 23, Acts 19, 21, I must also see Rome. Now, he assumes he will be a free man. He will go to Rome, but as a prisoner, in light of the events in Jerusalem now, he will reach Rome. In Acts 28, when Acts closes, the end of his fourth apostolic journey. That's a good place to stop. Two more verses. One more verse. Two more verses? Two. Two. Acts 9, 15. But the Lord said unto him, Ananias, 
Go thy way, for he, Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And we've read plenty about that already in Acts, haven't we? Yes. Amen, 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 amen. There will be even more of it for the remainder of Acts. Right. Thank you, dear Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen.